the negotiations were in the stadium and how Lindsey Nelson Stadium can improve a little bit. What were some of those conversations like and what maybe can we expect next season? Um, they were uh, ongoing, they were extensive, they're still going. It was something that we really couldn't conclude um, in a rel relatively reasonable amount of time. So we decided to move forward and basically set our personnel um, and kind of put that to rest and, and give everyone peace of mind with that, including our staff. And, uh, and then kind of treat it as that's part one, let's move on to part two. So at least now donors, fans, our, our recruits, our players, know exactly what we're looking to do with our baseball program as far as personnel goes, and that's be fully committed, uh, keep the band together, so to speak, as we say, together up uh, in the office, and then move on to step two, which is this, this stadium project. And there's so many different ideas, a new administration that's getting to know us, and a lot of these conversations were put on hold because we're in the middle of the season. And unfortunately, a lot of them involve red tape, whether it be, you know, legislatures or other big words that I don't really know that well uh, have to be involved, not just the administration and our baseball program. Now, I know that there's still going to have to be lots of architects coming in and doing this and that, but do you have some ideas of what you want out there? Yeah, we really do. The easy one is if you were fortunate enough to attend the Super Regional, uh, you saw we had a lot of rowdy fans down the left field line, but there, there could have been more and they could have been sitting in a, a little bit higher level of seat than just a bleacher and, and, and no disrespect in any form with that, but it was temporary seating we had to bring in. We would like at the very least semi-temporary seating to be there at the start of next year. Uh, we'd like to have those type of crowds for all of our SEC games and maybe even some of the others. So having something there would be nice for next year, but down the road, we, we have to get something that's permanent there and it'll, it will give a finished look to our stadium so when we do have recruits looking around like we did today, um, it'll be aesthetically pleasing, but also in game day, um, our opponent will be surrounded entirely by ball fans. And uh, I know it made for a, a winning edge for us when that was the case. Coach, how important do you feel those stadium renovations are to the long-term success of your program? I, I think to sustain it, it it's almost 100% uh, necessary. If you, if you follow college baseball, um, there's a couple things that are in place for all of the programs that have sustained success. Now, every now and then you see a blip on the radar screen or just a well-coached program that will come and go with their success, but only every now and again do they kind of jump onto the big stage, so to speak. Uh, but for the ones uh, that consistently are doing the things that uh, are getting them either to Omaha or, or again on the big stage in general, there's a formula there. And, and one of the things is not doesn't have to be in place, but for most of them, it's facilities or they've got some other, you know, benefit uh, going on. And, and so we need that to be an asset for us as well. How big of a recruiting pitch can that be for you to say, here's the hope that I have for this stadium, come be a part of UT baseball and build that is yours. Yeah, you know, I think it's kind of a parallel to when we first got the job, we had a vision and that was it. And we would lose some guys out to, well, I like your staff, but I want to go win right away. And it's like, well, our staff has won before. We just haven't done it together. Uh, we just got here together. Um, so the stadium is now a vision, whereas the vision we originally kind of presented to people was we feel like we can have a fun environment and a winning environment. Well, um, the challenge is on to have that for this coming year, but at least you can look at last year and say the proof is in the pudding a little bit. For the facilities that's now become here's our vision here's what's planned there is some money there um, there are things in the works but it's not as tangible as you'd like it to be to get it to be uh, a little further down the stages can be huge in recruiting uh, keeping guys from maybe signing that name in the draft uh, other things that can produce more and more wins and there's your sustained success recruiting four years ago when you got here to recruiting now after you guys have had some success how much different is it it's very different. Um, they know who we are at the park, which, which is nice. And, and thanks again to our players for creating that. Um, and the people now no longer want to know who we are. You, you know, it's a kid from across the country. Uh, well, here, we're in Knoxville and we're in the SEC. You've heard of the SEC, right? They're, we've kind of skipped past that a little bit, so it's nice. Uh, now, at the end of the day, it is about selecting uh, from the recruits perspective what school he wants to go to and then us selecting the guys we feel is the best match um, So to quantify how much it helps I guess we'll know in a few years 
on the field and, and our sport's so quirky with the draft and everything else. But if you're just talking about the environment that we now have when it comes to introducing ourselves to somebody or, you know, being at the airport or whatever it might be, it's, it's completely changed. And again, I'm thankful for the players that are still currently here and then the ones that have gone off uh, on to bigger and better things. How important was it when Evan Russell said he's coming back for a second senior season? Uh, it, it was a massive relief for me because my title is coach, uh, but we have other coaches that are here, whether it be strength coach, uh, pitching coach, recruiting coordinator, third base coach, and we have a player coach and, and Evan Russell. And on top of that, you, you know, I guess along the lines with coaching, part of it is you're kind of an ambassador for the program. And he's an ambassador in my mind, not just for our program, but an important part of the program, in-state talent, uh, in-state support, kids that grow up uh, being ball fans and cheering for ball fans and, and hold on to that dream of wearing the same uniform uh, that they're seeing when they're in the stands cheering for guys. Um, so a huge sense of relief, but the most important thing with that are guys like him and Luke will be available to say, this is what worked last year or the year before. This is our brand name, this is our flavor, and when he says this, this is what he means. Or maybe the coaches don't even have to say it. They initiate it with those guys. So uh, a big benefit of having Evan back. With those other guys like Luke Redman, other guys who have decisions to make, have they given you an indication of where they are in the process? Yeah, I think Redman's 100% in. And it was a, it's a scene that's tough to recreate with words. Uh, when the younger guys saw that, because there, he was in limbo a little bit. I mean, at some point, as you get older, you got to start making – uh, adult decisions and uh, the younger guys were elated when they saw that that was what was going to go on with with how he kind of stood up in a meeting uh, and then with Luke he's a hundred percent in academically put everything in order um, he's already prepping things and uh, Redmond will certainly be a leader uh, but at you know uh, Evan Russell and, and Luke Lipschitz I've already kind of teased him a little bit any competition we have or the fall world series there'll be two different teams and, and those guys will be split up and We'll see who the better uh, quote unquote captain is. Did you ever think you'd have your own bobblehead dog? No, <laughs> no, and I don't know that that's worthy. And um, I haven't seen a finished product or anything, so hopefully I, I don't look too goofy. But um, it, it, it's pretty cool how everyone's rallied around everyone in, in, in this program. I mean, Evan Russell, I don't think ever would imagine that it'd be such a big thing. I mean, I have people, I don't even know who they are, stopping me at these games, these high school games I'm out recruiting. Congrats on Evan. And, you know, I'm not on social media, so I was last to hear that he posted something, but I, I knew he was coming back. And to have people from different states getting excited about something like that, uh, it, it's, it's pretty, been, pretty awesome to be kind of on the incline of improvement that we are and having other people kind of boost us up. Well, there you go. I, I don't <laughs> look too shabby, I don't think. The, I need to hit the weight room with those legs that are a little small, but, but the, the, the bobblehead deal looks good. See, he's got the gator on your neck. Yeah, I kind of like that because uh, there, there's a lot of bitter memories and a lot of positive memories about the pandemic times or whatever you want to label that. Uh, I'll forever kind of have a place in my heart for that 2020 team, the two type of kids they were, um, and also how good they could have been. I mean, Zach Daniels just gets bumped up to double A, Garrett right up to the big leagues. Uh, but then also this year's team dealing with that. Um, if you looked at college football, they were the first ones kind of, at least one of the major sports to be involved in that environment. And you had to overcome not just the opponent or other things, but you know, beating tests and things like that. And these guys did a good job with that. So I, I, don't, I don't mind seeing that deal on there. You've had a little bit to look back at the past season and what are just, what are some things that come to mind? What are things that are going to stick with you forever? And how do you hope that just continues on in team after team after team? Yeah, um, I think I'll, get, I'll gain composure here by saying one thing. I think handing the baton off to the next guy is key. And there are guys that are ready to have that, but COVID kind of made it quirky. So having a guy like Evan Russell that'll be back and, and can make sure that um, hey, this is how we do things here is, is handed down to the next group of guys and then someone else will be that person is huge. And then uh, I had to make a late night drive from uh, one high school event to another. Uh, so you're just trying to stay awake on the highway and I had the playlist going. And if you ever need to stay awake, Chad Dallas's walkout song popping on there. It was just on shuffle. 
Uh, but it got me pretty good. It got me pretty good. I yeah. tell her, your dad told me uh, when, sorry, were you finished? Okay. Uh, I need to be finished. <laughs> <laughs> it's like you stopped, and I didn't know. Uh, your dad told me when we were in Omaha that you never stopped working, and that's why he's so proud of you. Have you taken a second to enjoy what you just did in that, the 2021 season? Yeah, that, that was kind of that moment. Um, I, I think in this role, it's not as easy to throw things and punch things as it was when I was an assistant if we lose. And um, thanks to you guys, or no thanks to you guys, if we win or lose, the next thing, you know, I try to teach our players next thing, next thing. The next thing you have is an interview. Uh, so it actually kind of helps, you know, keep things in line. And then you need to kind of tell everyone what the schedule is the next day. Um, so I don't consider myself any more important, especially in our strength coach or some of these other guys, what they do. But this role kind of forces you to be next thing, be on task. And uh, while I don't consider myself mature, uh, I think I've, I've kind of been able to do that and, and it's kept you kept me busy. So you don't get that moment of reflection that maybe the what you should. And uh, just random on the highway, a song pops on and uh, I'll, I'll miss those guys. I know that, you know, I remember how, how excited y'all were when, you know, you were able to convince Jordan Beck to come play here and not sign. And, that was a big deal at the time, but a kid like Burns, assuming that he ends up sticking to his word and, and comes, it seems like an even higher level prospect that makes that decision. Is that sort of a sign of where things are with the program now that you can convince a kid like that to come here? I, I, think, I think that applies in a lot of different things. If you're gonna do something, you wanna see that it's okay to do it. Uh, um, a crazy example, I was in Costa Rica and my buddy swung on a, uh, they called it a Tarzan swing, but you went way out into the woods and if that thing snaps, it's over. And I was like, there's no way I'm doing that thing. But he did it and then I watched a few others do it and I was like, all right, I think I might survive. So <laughs> I did it. Of course, the guy gave me the old on three and he said one, two and threw me out there. I might send you the video, it's pretty entertaining, but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, probably worst analogy in the world, but now these kids see, well, wait a minute, Blake Tidwell said no, and then look at what he did. I, I can do that. So it's a little scary to say no to your, your dream is to play professional baseball and here's the opportunity. And it's the right thing for some kids. Uh, but I think for a vast majority, it is not. And the one thing that a kid, like you mentioned a couple of examples, what I assure you, Jordan Beck, as each day goes on, he's more and more thankful that it's the path he chose. And I think for some of those guys, if they have any lingering thoughts of, well, maybe what if I would have done this or not? When you're in this environment and you're following the natural se sequence of your life, um, I think you, you get more and more satisfied that it was the choice you made and you're in a great environment. Did you see, uh, I talked to Camden Sewell's mom up in Omaha and she was telling me the story because you know, he grew up a Florida fan. Oh yeah. He threw away his key and his bed sheets and all that stuff. Um, wouldn't sleep on the bed anymore because they were Florida sheets once he committed. Uh, what, what does that kid bring to this, to this team? Um, you, you know, I think him being back, he, he's been one of our best get outs guys. Um, you know, we, we just talked about the draft. There are certain uh, things that pro, pro, pro uh, scouts are looking for. Um, but at the end of the day, one thing everyone's looking for is just to get outs. And so he's done it in a variety of ways because of, you know, his path and his career. But he's been one of our best guys at just getting outs. So when you're in a bind this past year, Sean Hunley's one of the most popular guys to say, get him hot. Well, Camden was as well, but now he kind of slides up into a situation where maybe he's that guy. You also lose two weekend starters. We, we never really had a Tuesday starter. Um, so he, he's kind of a swing man and can do those things as well. So much like Evan and Luke's leadership, it, it just gives you comfort and it relieves stress up in the office because um, the Tennessee fans have been great to us, but they're human. You do it once, let's see it again. And uh, that's understandable, and that's kind of where you want to be at with your standards. But in order to uh, adhere to those, there's a lot of stress that's got to be spent to make sure you got pieces of the puzzle, and, and Camden's a huge one. Seth Halverson and uh, Dolan, they're just, what did you see from those guys, and what do they have to y'all's pitching next year? Uh, I think they can be potential first rounders. Uh, I think they are potential first rounders, therefore I think they can be. Um, you know, Chase is such a good kid, I think it's a seamless entry into kind of our culture. Uh, and then it's a unique deal where our guys kind of all know who he is. 
because he pitched against us. Um, and, and then the same goes for Halverson. He knows the league. Uh, he pitched on Friday nights, which is kind of the ultimate goal for most pitchers, unless they're a closer and, and, and they like that. Um, but two guys that can be another version of a Garrett Crochet, a Chad Dallas, Garrett Stallings, and what Blake Tidwell seems to be coming. Um, so all in all, it could make for some really fun competition in the fall to see who can have pole position to be that opening day starter. And then sometimes when you got a staff, um, there's a team in our league that could talk about this last year. Sometimes it doesn't become about who's the best guy because you got two or three guys that are the best guy. Then you kind of play your hand for maybe this guy's better on this day for this reason or this is the way we want to kind of map it out. How different is that facing guys that you can potentially get in transfer portal? Obviously, you never know who's going to go in, but yeah, just that, kind of always scouting. Th that's a little scary. I, I don't, um, you know, I don't think I ever want to be playing an opponent and keeping a checklist of, you know, it, it's a little crazy. And now when you go out scouting, I used to just flat out ignore guys that were committed to other schools, but now you feel like you at least need to know who the guy is in case a coaching change happens or something like that. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of negatives and positives to the transfer portal. The bottom line is, uh, if we're gonna bring somebody from the outside in our program, if they're a junior college guy or someone coming from another four-year school, there's a lot of info statistically and also research you can do to make sure this guy fits exactly who we are. And those two pitchers you mentioned have endless talent physically, but I think their work ethic, their energy, the way they interacted with our staff and our coaches when we were recruiting them, um, they're, they're a seamless match. Two more guys. I guess without delving into specifics, are there areas where you're still looking to sort of fortify from the portal? I mean, maybe lost a couple of veteran catchers last year. Is there anywhere that you're still kind of got your radar up for looking at guys? Yeah, you know, the catching thing is um, whether we're looking, um, you know, deeply or just kind of putting feelers out there, the catching thing is going to be a position where uh, Landon, Jackson, Pete, and, and Pav have been the guys since we've been on campus. They're all gone. So um, there'll be new faces back there. And it's a spot where you'd like to play a couple guys if you could, and you need someone you know, that's available too if there's some injuries. So that, that's, I think you kind of hit the nail on the head with that spot, but as much as I miss, we'll miss those position players, there's guys that are ready that are incoming or that were kind of pushed to the back of the bus because of the pandemic. Uh, and then on the mound, I mean, and Frank, we trust. Uh, there's great arms available. Uh, the two dynamic ones we talked about will fill big roles for us. Very fortunate to have guys like Sewell and Redmond back that we just mentioned, but there, there's other guys too. and. Uh, last year, we were kind of craving to expand the group of guys that we were using in intense situations. Um, next year, I don't know that we'll have that problem. Uh, so it'll be fun to see. Yes, yeah, it's kind of the other thing I was going to ask. When you look at last season, I know analytically every team is different because if you lose some things, you maybe gain some in other ways. But is there something that you're looking at the program in an area or a position or a statistical category where you think if we can take the next step there, we're, we're in a really good shape? You know, I, I think the draft and your recruiting will leave your roster on paper a little bit different each year. Uh, maybe more firepower one year. Or, you know, uh, again, it's, it's about winning games, so it doesn't have to be fancy or, uh, you know, impressive. So it's hard to judge what's on paper. For me, the challenge that's truly out there is for next year's group uh, to pick up where we left off team chemistry-wise, the energy level, the attitude that they played with, um, and, and all those things are tough to, to grade out on paper statistically. You just got to kind of feel it. And so from day one, we'll hand the reins off to some of those older guys and, and get them to get everybody on board with the way we do things. So to me, I, I don't think there's one thing we've got to do drastically to get to where we got. We just need to play better if we're fortunate enough to get there. Uh, but the formula that got there was good players, a lot of hard work, having fun, and, and then, you know, Kind of that that brand name that became ours of, of far, as far as how the players went about their business. Tony uh, Berkey told me at the World Series that he's never seen this fan base as you know in on a coach as they were on you. Just talk about your love for this fan base as well. Uh, it's I uh, it's why I'm standing here. <laughs> it's why I'm standing here. So um, I guess I could send you the text messages if you want, but. You know, I got my friends make comments and 
it's pretty uncomfortable to talk about personal stuff with people because uh, that's what it is and um, hopefully I've got a lot of flaws but one thing has not been focused on anything other than trying to meet the standards that kind of my dad plugged into my head and so that's all I want to do and uh, but I want to do it at a place that I'm in love with and I like a lot of things about this place uh, but that that deal outside the hotel in Omaha and some other other reasons that's why I'm standing right here coach what's one word you yeah. would use to some of your feelings about your program as it stands today um, you know not satisfied would be a, a wrong answer uh, you know improper way to answer but that's the first instinct uh, but uh, very very thankful very thankful uh, some of the credit you get and some of the things you see when you go about town and uh, the position you're in just in a lot of different situations incredibly thankful because any sport it, it, it's right for someone to say you know Bill Belichick you know what a mastermind and stuff like that but you know we and I'm not criticizing that guy but we now know you might need a quarterback too and the quarterback probably needs somebody to block for him and there probably needs to be somebody in the video room that has stuff available for them to watch and prepare so uh, we talk about it all the time here if you watch any movie um, we were using The Hangover as an example, some pretty good acting performances and big names in there. But there's also some smaller guys like The Doctor and, and that just absolutely nail it. And so to do something good, you probably need some, some great pieces, but to do something great or phenomenal, you need a lot of pieces, seen and unseen areas uh, to be covered and to be done well. Uh, so that's way off the map of baseball. but. I'm thankful that I'm surrounded by a bunch of people that I owe a lot, uh, whether it be players or coaches or something in between. And uh, there's my answer. You'll be great in <laughs>